Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Olson with the National Tile Contractors Association. And not only do I want to welcome you and thank you for taking the time out of your busy uh, schedule to attend today, I want to thank you for your patience. We've had a little technical difficulty, and uh, I believe we've figured it out and we're ready to go with today's webinar, which is titled Floor Flatness Requirements for Ceramic Tile and Stone Installation and is sponsored by Custom Building Products. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you will be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your question, and we'll answer your questions at the end of this presentation. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on the invite to this webinar and listen on your phone. As a reminder, all of our webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented, giving you easier access to watch and or share all current and past programs at your convenience. Okay, here we go. We're very lucky today. We have two speakers, two great speakers. Our first speaker is Howard Jancy, CSI, CDT, is a commercial architectural service representative for custom building products. He has 30 years experience with tile, stone, and concrete flooring design, installation, and, remedi and uh, remediation. His responsibilities include specification writing and review, technical service, and continuing education. Howard's article, For the Want of a Horseshoe Nail, Identifying Causes of Tile Failure was published in the Construction Specifier Magazine, March of 2017. His articles have been published in Landscape Contractor National Magazine and the Journal of Architectural Codings. He has also been a presenter at World of Concrete. His expertise includes CSI Division 03, 04, 07, and 09 products and processes. He works with the contractor, distributor, designer, specifier, and owner through all project phases. He understands the complexities and capabilities of a building products uh, of a building products attributes to meet the architect's requirements and the owner's vision. Our second speaker today, William White, Director of Technical Communications and Training at Custom Building Products, has over 35 years in the flooring industry and is a member of the Tile Council of North America, National Tile Contractors Association. Natural Stone Institute, American National Standards Institute, International Concrete Institute Tech, uh, Technical Committees, and member of National Wood Flooring Association. And this is the first time this has been said, but Will White will be accepted to the NTCA Technical Committee as a voting member uh, at TSP this year in October. Welcome, Ooh. Howard. Welcome, Will. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to the group today. Uh, since we're a little bit late on the start, we're going to uh, move through this uh, with a little bit more uh, speed than normal, but I think we'll convey the message. Will, next slide, please. All right, we're into the learning objectives, Howard. All right, there we go. Uh, there's often a thought that uh, floor prep can be casually admitted, uh, reason being that once we put a tile down, install some mortar, utilize a membrane, no one will know that the tile has not been prepared effectively. But ultimately, tiles will crack, delaminate, grout will fail. So again, surface preparation, substrate preparation is a very important part of uh, of a tile installation. It's the Achilles heel. Ignore it. There will be problems at some later date. Next slide, Will. All right. <laughs> All right, I have to jump in here. We seem to still be having some problems. Uh, we lost. All right, Will, can you go to the next slide? I'm trying to go to the next slide. Jim, there it goes. It's like right. I go to webinar, kind of locked up for a second. 
All right, everybody, we're gonna have fun today. This will be a little yes. exciting, so stay with us. Thank you. Um, today's tile products uh, are the driver behind uh, floor preparation. By their very size, spanning large areas, these tiles require an almost perfect substrate to perform later after installation. Uh, gauge panels up to five by 10 feet, even the narrow plank tiles are large format. So again, leveling is very important aspect of a tile installation. Next slide, Will. webinar is not cooperating. Will, when you hover over the, the screen, can you go back on and hover over the screen at the bottom? There's some arrows. I think that'll help you. Put your yeah, arrow I'm, over. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, showing and uh, it's can just you click, Can you just click on Click on that screen real quick. Just click on it. Okay. We're having all kinds of difficulties today. Right. At the bottom, you see the arrows at the bottom now? No. See the, the faint arrows at the yes. bottom? There we go. All right. Start. Let's use Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. All right, Howard. Um, all right, uh, so if we look at some of the qualities of the tiles, for example, rectified edges, perfectly square tiles, uh, once installed, if the floor is not leveled, those perfectly square and straight tiles will not have uniform grout joints. Uh, another for a very important reason for uh, uh, prepping a substrate is mortar coverage. It's very important that mortar is consistently combed or applied across the surface. If mortar thickness varies, you could have problems with voids underneath the tile or shrinkage of the mortar damaging the tile. Also, tile lippage can be affected by a lack of substrate preparation. Uh, lippage is an aesthetic issue, can be a trip hazard or a cleanliness issue, but again, properly prepping a floor within the requirements of 1 8 inch and 10 feet for large format is very important. Next slide. Uh, for large format tiles, the requirement is 1 8 inch and 10 feet. For tiles smaller than 15, uh, 12 by 12, for example, 1 quarter inch and 10. But with today's finishing uh, placements uh, methods for concrete, generally the best you're going to see is 1 quarter inch and 10. So typically most all of your jobs, new construction, are going to require some amount of leveling or prep. So even the newest concrete is going to require a keen eye and some evaluation whether or not uh, prepping is required and how much. Next slide, please move on. Next slide, click. As far as measuring flatness, uh, the two methods, what, what we're looking at on the left, we see the tile contractor with his straight, straight edge. That's a qualitative measurement. He's looking for daylight underneath the slab or underneath the straight edge, whereas on the right is a more quantitative method uh, where the GC or concrete contractor has employed an engineering firm to precisely measure deviation from plane. So these are the two ways of evaluating flatness of the floor. Next slide, please. Next click. Uh, these two measurement systems, straight edge versus FF number, are distinctly different measurement methods. There's differences in the number of measurement locations, minimum, maximum number of measurements, but it's the bottom two bullet points. Measurements made just prior to floor installation for a straight edge, measurements made prior uh, 72 hours after the uh, slab pour, that causes the biggest problems when it comes to tile installation. Next slide, please. Next slide. If we take a look at Division Three, oftentimes the concrete is specified and even installed long before Division Nine is even considered. Uh, the concrete contractor is 
uh, is given a contract with a specified F number or a goal for flatness. And once he installs the concrete, within three days, uh, those FF numbers are measured. If he hits his FF numbers, uh, he is given a paycheck and he leaves the job. Whereas a tile contractor, months after concrete installation shows up on the job, he takes out his straight edge and randomly places it along different areas on the slab, and he tells you your concrete is not flat enough for tile installation. Next click, Will. And the reason for that, concrete as it dries will shrink and curl at the breaks, the edges, the joints. So concrete that is flat three days after pour is not necessarily going to be flat weeks, months later when the tile contractor has to install tile. So even the flattest concrete three days after placement is not going to be a flat enough for a tile installation at a later date. Next slide, please. If we look at F numbers and straight edge, first of all, there is no direct correlation between the two measurements. Approximately uh, 25, an FM number of 25 will give you about a one quarter inch in 10. Uh, FF of 50 is about a one eighth inch in 10, and that's what's required for large format. But it's very costly to install an FF50 floor and bottom line, even if it's installed at an FF50 and measured such, months later, it's probably going to curl, deform, cup, and chain shape. So again, what's the best way to address getting a flat floor relative to large format tile? Next click. Again. Uh, is probably using self-leveling. We've done some internal testing where if a floor was required to be an FF50, uh, we did some measurement or again, in-house testing and determined that a self-leveling material would give you an FF of 86.6. So well above the 1 8 inch and 10 for large format tile. So again, uh, self-leveling from the standpoint of cost and, 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 and installation is a better route to go as opposed to making that concrete slab super flat, if you will, at the time of installation. Next slide, please. And, and if I may, Howard, that 86, that 86 was done uh, without any leveling pens or benchmark. This was simply uh, mixing of the product, pouring, placement, walk away, and, and let it flow and, and seek its own level. So uh, with some additional care during the application process, it's very possible that 86 number could be closer to 100. So just so everyone understands that number. All right, next slide, Will, please. So there are some new standards for uh, self-leveling underlayment. Underlayment products have been around for many years, but there were no standards uh, of uniformity for the product. ANSI has come up with two standards, and typical for tile setting materials, there's a product standard that descri describes the product's uh, minimal characteristics and performance, and then there's a standard that tells you how to install it. So ANSI 118.16.08.21 are brand new and will be published uh, sometime in the near future. Will, you want to comment on that, please? Uh, yeah, this uh, the balloting, the official uh, revised versions balloted, uh, it started about two weeks ago. Um, I, I suspect that most of the ballots have probably already been turned in, and we all fully expect that this will be ratified and approved, uh, because uh, the few oppositions that were noted, uh, they've been addressed, and uh, everybody should approve it, so we should see this within the next month or so um, become available and then obviously digitally and then uh, in the next print versions on the ANSI books. All right, next slide, Will, please. Now, as far as the product standard, uh, these are some key features. First of all, the standard only applies to tile, a ceramic tile and natural, natural stone, no other flooring product. Uh, as we'll see later, there's many different formulations from a manufacturer for underlayments. Uh, this standard applies to all of those different formulations. 
Uh, there's a minimum compressive strength. So again, uh, you'll know what that product can withstand as far as impact, rolling load, dynamic load, et cetera, over that floor. And the product has to be rated for extra heavy service uh, per TCNA. So again, minimum requirements or uh, requirements from the 118.6 product. Next slide. And here are some of the uh, uh, performance characteristics of a product that conforms to the, to the standard. Uh, uh, you've got a compressive strength at 3,000 PSI, a tensile strength. Uh, but more importantly, in my mind, is the flow and healing. And we'll talk more about that later. But again, with the standard available, uh, all manufacturers will be manufacturing products that conform or exceed to this standard. So again, when you specify an underlayment, you'll know the level of quality, level of performance to expect uh, once the product is cured and hardened. Next slide, please. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this standard is only for ceramic tile and stone, uh, stone tile. Uh, you'll notice in the dark uh, bolded print there, that, uh, this standard uh, is the underlayment is used to flatten the substrate, not level. Uh, I know I do, but maybe we all do. We use flat and, and level interchangeably, but they are not, at least in, in with regard to the standard. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, leveling, uh, again, is, uh, is a different process, more involved process. There's more labor, more materials involved. It involves pinning the floor and precisely measuring deviation or high points. Uh, so again, if you want to flatten the floor for the purposes of eliminating one eighth inch and ten variation, uh, that's what the standard is, is directed towards. Leveling a more involved process. Make sure you understand what you're trying to achieve for that floor. And if you're bidding the job, make sure you understand what you're bidding on, flattening or leveling a floor. Will, you want to elaborate a little bit more, please? Uh, no, it was a great job, Howard. And the photo, I think, describes the additional work required to survey uh, to reach a level uh, application. But just something else to take away on that. Leveling typically isn't plausible on most projects because of adjacent finishes and elevation restraints. So um, we've had many issues in the industry of a self-leveling underlayment being perceived uh, to provide a level application. So this installation standard is an excellent standard to set precedent and, and expectation across the different segments from you know specification all the way through to contractors installation application all right next slide will please and to better illustrate the flattening versus level uh, the top floor is level but not flat we see variation in the surface greater than one eighth inch and ten so with flattening we will fill in those low points and proceed to tile installation in the bottom diagram, that floor is flat, and we can install tile on that flat floor. But if it's not level, again, more time, more labor, more material would be used. So again, understand what the goal or objective of the project or specification is. Uh, are we trying to flatten it, as we just showed, or level it? Two distinctly different processes, even though they sound alike, flattening and leveling. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as manufacturers, we make different types of leveling products, uh, whether or not the, the driver is budget, working time, how thin, how thick a product can be applied, cure time, strength, abrasion resistance. So there's a lot of different bag materials available from manufacturers. Uh, next slide, please. And click again, Will. So the question is, why can't we make one product to serve all our needs? Uh, why do we have to have, what, eight or nine different materials there? If we take a look on the right, those are your basic, uh, those are the basic uh, constituents of a, of a self-leveling material. Cement, sand, plasticizers, polymers, and stabilizers. And for each of the green highlighted items, uh, as an example, 
the ingredients on the right might change. So again, we have uh, a very sophisticated product here chemically. Uh, so again, the ingredients are very important to whatever aspect's important to your installation at the time. So again, many different products to choose from. Uh, the materials are not, are not the same with just different names on the back. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to leveling materials, there are patching products that each manufacturer uh, makes available. These patching materials can be skimmed or fill in deeper areas. They can be used uh, by themselves or in combination or in conjunction with a leveling material. So again, uh, typically a floor flattening uh, will require uh, both materials, sometimes just the skim coat may suffice. But again, understand there are patching materials available, uh, high strength as are the self-leveling products. Next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned early on the, uh, one of the important reasons for leveling a floor is that you want to apply a mortar in a uniform thickness. Uh, the other reason, too, is you, uh, you don't want to use mortars for flattening a surface. Mortars are strictly formulated for direct bond. You should not use them for flattening. Uh, and we'll pro proceed to say, uh, tell why that's important to note or understand. Next slide, please. Uh, mortars have an ideal thickness after tile embedment. It's your, your standard thin set, meaning for a 12 by 12 tile, generally after embedment, that mortar is typically maximum one quarter inch thick. For large format tile, LHT, large and heavy tile, generally after tile embedment, mortars are formulated to be a maximum one half inch thick. If you apply mortar excessively thick, as we see in the picture, we see an inch thick uh, mortar application, you can have problems with uh, uh, mortar shrinkage, damaging the tile, you may create voids. But it's very important that the floor is leveled first so that when the mortar is combed or applied to the substrate, it is a uniform thickness across the, uh, across the surface. You don't want to have thick and thin, thick and thin areas of mortar because again, you will have problems with uh, long-term performance of that tile surface. Next slide. Uh, those little dimples that we see across the surface, that is mortar that is that has cured and as it cured it bonded to the bottom of the tile and it shrank so much it pulled down and created these uh, created or uh, these dimples or uh, deflections or dimples in the surface. So the only remedy for that is tearing out the tile. Next slide. Here it's a little bit hard to see, and if you click again, Will, those round circular, back one, uh, those round circular cracks there, again, those show you where there's spots of mortar overly applied, too thick, and as that mortar shrank, it pulled on the tile and, and cracked. So again, spot bonding or any any method of generating irregular, uh, any means that you uh, that are employed to, that creates uneven mortar thickness, you can have damage to the tile. Next slide. Right. And this is also one of Jim's favorite installation methods, spot bonding. Well, spot bonding is not approved by any of uh, the TCNA methods, except one if you're using epoxy on vertical surfaces. Uh, with spot bonding, it's often done to correct the problem with uncollapsed ridges. And once you do spot bonding, even with aggressive tile embedment, and that's a rubber mallet being beaten on the surface, you cannot collapse the ridges. You will get voids underneath the tile and a future crack in the tile. Next slide, please. Well, Will, I just wanted to mention that NTCA, that last video you saw there, we custom building products uh, sponsored a uh, trowel and air video. It's now in uh, Spanish, English, and Russian, and it talks about the correct way to trowel, and spot bonding is not a recommended way to install tile. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, next slide, Will. Well, you're going backwards, Will, at least that's what I'm seeing. There we go. That's where I want to be. So here we see spot bonding, and uh, why was spot bonding done? First of all, we see uncollapsed ridges. 
We see mortar combed in different directions. Uh, the installer pulled up the tile, realized he wasn't getting collapsed ridges, so he took his margin trowel or his trowel, threw down little spots of mortar, and he thought the problem was solved as far as coverage. Uh, that was incorrect. So by leveling first, your mortar is consistent. Uh, you'll get consistent collapsing of the ridges, minimal voids, and that's very important for long-term performance. Uh, so voids under ceramic tile, 80% under dry, in dry areas, 95% if conditions are a bit more aggressive. Natural stone, which is more brittle, again, 95% mortar coverage. So that's very important uh, in the specification uh, to, to dictate what level of mortar coverage is required, 80 or 95. But that's why it's important to have a level surface or a flattened surface prior to the installation of tile. Next slide. Uh, surface prep is required for self-leveling underlayments. Anything that's a bond breaker, dirt, oil, grease, residual, grout, uh, residual mortars, anything foreign on the surface needs to be removed. If the concrete is defective, that defective or weakened concrete also needs to re be removed. So the performance of the underlayment and the tile assembly above it is, is only as good as the substrate. Uh, here we see a perfectly good, uh, well-performed or well-prepped surface. Uh, prepping not only removes contamination and weak concrete, it can, uh, it can uh, uh, show you where you have some other concerns, cracking that may need to be repaired or remediated in some way. Aggressive prep is typically done mechanically. Next slide. Here we see a blast track machine that shoots out a small little metallic BB. It removes contamination, it removes uh, weakened concrete, and surface prep, again, is typically mechanical. We're either talking grinding or shot blasting. Uh, the International Concrete Repair uh, Institute created a surface profile guide. A CSP3 is required generally for, uh, for tile setting materials, underlayments, so again, aggressive prep is important. Uh, a broom uh, and a, a broom, a mop and a bucket, a squeegee and garden hose is not good surface prep. Also important to surface prep is vapor, moisture vapor mitigation. The underlayment products are permeals. So any, any moisture that's coming up from the slab will travel through the underlayment and affect uh, the flooring above it, particularly if it's moisture sensitive flooring. Next slide. And typically with excessive moisture drive, uh, oops, next slide there, uh, and the moisture uh, is a source, the source for that is from the mixed water and the mixed design, as well as water randomly added to the surface during insulation. So this moisture has to leave the concrete before it can start installation of some of the products we're talking about, the underlay materials. Drying time is 30 days for every inch of concrete. So again, any excess moisture added during insulation will create problems. Even Mother Nature, if that slab is not enclosed or covered every time it rains, you wet out the concrete, that drying time starts again. So again, as soon as you can get a facility enclosed, that much better as far as installing self-leveling materials as well as the tile setting materials uh, above it. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. Next slide, keep moving it through. And moisture mitigation, typically uh, that is remedied with 100% solids epoxy product. Uh, the material is applied to a clean prep surface. It is back rolled. You want a uniform thickness and you want a surface without voids or pinholes. Don't give, uh, you don't want to give that moisture any opportunity to escape from underneath that membrane. Next slide. Uh, concrete cracks, and uh, we have introduced joints during installation to minimize random cracking of the concrete. Uh, you have expansion joints for thermal expansion of the concrete over time, and we have control or contraction joints, saw cuts, that are strategically placed to eliminate random cracking uh, during the initial drying. But these same joints that are important for concrete to, uh, for the concrete to perform must be brought up through 
uh, the underlayment product. Next slide. Uh, there's two ANSI standards, or excuse me, TCNA details uh, that de uh, that uh, give you some detail regarding the use of underlayment products uh, over uh, concrete as far as movement goes. Uh, in, the, in this one, uh, we'll see an expansion joint where the expansion joint in the concrete travels up through the underlayment and the tile work in the same plane at the same point. So as the concrete is expanding, contracting with it, the underlayment and the tile work uh, also move with it in tandem without cracking or damage. So for an expansion joint or movement cracks, you cannot tile over it. You should not place an underlayment over it. Hiding it with an underlayment does not minimize the damage a moving joint will do to that tile that's going to be installed at a later date. Next slide, please. Uh, here we see a representation, a detail of a partial crack isolation membrane. Uh, the membrane is used over a static crack or static joint. That membrane, again, is placed directly over the, uh, again, static joint. Uh, and then on both sides of the tile, as you can see, there's a soft joint installed. So again, this is the use of a crack isolation membrane. Uh, to minimize any problem with static cracks or joint. This is not to be done with a movement joint or an expansion joint. Next slide, couple clicks, Will. Click again. And as far as static crack repair, you have a couple methods to choose from. You could route out the crack, as we see on the left, and pour in or apply a neat epoxy 100% solids or you can take that same epoxy add a clean graded sand and create a trowel mix for uh, filling wider cracks or joints uh, and this material using an epoxy is somewhat of a, a, a has structural integrity uh, it will be uh, it will uh, the patching material uh, epoxy patch material tends to perform better than a cementitious product for these purposes but crack repair crack filling is important prior to the installation of an underlayment product next slide will next slide uh, primers are important first step with a uh, Underlayment installation, uh, it suppresses water loss from the SLU. Uh, if that substrate concrete is a rigid sponge, it'll suck out moisture. It'll affect cement chemistry and cement strength gain. If that slab draws water out of the underlayment, it affects workability, flow rate, and heal rate, which is, again, a negative. Uh, so, again, it's very important to add or use a, a primer correctly. Also, the primer helps to bind together any residual uh, particles or fragments or dust that's left over from, let's say, the prep, uh, the prepping stage. Also, the primer is absorbed into the concrete and consolidates or strengthens the concrete surface. So the primer is, is a very important step. And again, the most important reason, because it prevents the slab from sucking out moisture from the SLU. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, if you have a trench in the substrate, again, uh, pay attention to priming. A trench is done for utilities. The trench is generally a different mix design, a different finished or cured qualities than the adjacent concrete. So it may be more porous than uh, the concrete on either side. So pay attention when you put a primer down, you want to see a distinct film. If you have a, a very absorbent surface, you may need to apply the primer. First application diluted three to one, followed by multiple applications until you get a distinct film or uh, on, on the surface. So again, uh, primer application may be require more than one step prior to a tile or an underlayment installation. Next slide. Yeah, excellent, Howard, and if I may add also when yep. we see trenching for utilities on grade or on ground, more than likely the vapor barrier or retarder has been breached 
more than likely it has not been properly replaced. So something else to consider when working over trench work on ground or on grade. All right. As far as primers available, uh, there's different chemical formulations, acrylics, epoxies, waterbound epoxies, and you'll see high performance acrylic latex. That product covers or handles most of the substrate conditions that, uh, that exist. So the high performance acrylics are, are very useful materials. Uh, again, a high performance on occasion when you have certain surfaces such as a metallic or metal surface, epoxy might be warranted, but the high performance acrylics, uh, again, handle a, a variety of substrate uh, conditions. So again, check with your manufacturer what they recommend for the substrate uh, as well as for their underlayment product. Next slide, please. Uh, absorption of the surface. So again, if we see what if we see, see the condition on the left when we uh, drop a few uh, drops of water on the surface, if it readily absorbs in, you know you've got a, uh, a, a excessively absorbent surface. Uh, so again, when you apply the primer, you may need to do a three to one water to primer application. If you continue to continue to drop water down to test and see absorption, you need to apply more primer. And ultimately, you want to reach the condition that you see on the right where that water dropped on the surface beads up and is not absorbed into the surface. That's what you want to see with a properly applied primer. Uh, and depending on the, the manufacturer and the primer, you may see a, a residual film, a, glo a gloss, or a color to it. But again, uh, you want to satisfy the thirst of that substrate with multiple applications of primer before you install the underlayment material. Next slide. Uh, here we have a nice visual indicator that no primer was used or it was insufficiently primed. You see those little pock marks? That's air that evacuated from the substrate because there was no primer. And the air, as it uh, moves through the underlayment, and it created those little dimples or pinholes at the surface. Since moisture was sucked out of the underlayment by the substrate, uh, the, uh, the underlayment product was weakened, and we could uh, we see that by the dusted surface that we were able to scrape up, scrape up with that corner. So again, prior to installation of the tile materials, tile setting materials, we need to take a screen and remove that dusted or weakened surface. But again, insufficient primer can lead to defects in the underlayment, uh, performance, uh, minimize the performance underlayment, which ultimately impacts the performance of your tile floor. Next slide. Uh, absorbent surfaces, again, we mentioned diluted three to one water to primer. That material needs to be brushed or uh, br uh, br brushed in. The bristles help work it into the pores, work it into the surface. Non-absorbent substrates, you don't dilute the product, and it's typically applied with a three-eighth inch nap roller, so two distinctly different methods. And understand what's, again, with absorbent substrates, multiple applications may be required to satisfy the thirst of that concrete, diluted, and then ultimately full strength application. Next slide. Examples of non-absorbent surfaces as we see on the left. So again, check with the manufacturer what they recommend for surface prep over these materials, what they recommend for primer and underlayment. The success of installing tile or underlayment over these various substrates uh, hinges on the quality of that material. If you're installing over ceramic tile, how well bonded is the ceramic tile? What is its condition? So any defects in these existing substrates must be eliminated or completely removed before you install an underlayment and attempt tile installation over that. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as epoxy primer, uh, that's best used with, when you have extra service, uh, an extra heavy service rating floor. Uh, TCNA defines or describes what an extra heavy service floor is. Uh, if you're installing underlayment and tile over a metal surface, or you have elevated floors that have uh, that exhibit allowable deflection, so 
So an epoxy plus a sand broadcast, uh, and the sand broadcast is done to allow uh, a better bond of the underlayment material over uh, of the tile setting materials, underlayment materials over it. Next slide. And typically, when epoxy and uh, uh, and plus sand uh, installation, you're spreading out, uh, moving, uh, spreading out the epoxy. You broadcast sand to rejection, remove the excess sand, and you're ready to go as far as tile insulation, underlayment installation. Uh, once that uh, once that floor has been cleaned from any residual sand or loose material. Next slide, please. Um, once we start the SLU installation, we got to pay attention to temperature. Ideal range is 50 to 90 degrees. Uh, if it's too cold, too hot, you could have problems. And also understand uh, there's a good amount of cement in these underlayments. As the temperature lowers below 50, uh, that cement chem chemistry can slow down, as well as the chemistry of the whole system. So watch the high and low temperatures both substrate, ambient, and product. Uh, uh, if you don't, to high temperatures, you may lose working time. Low temperatures, you may delay the, delay the set of the material. So again, temperature condi conditions are something that have to be monitored or modified if you can. Next slide. Humidity is also a culprit. Uh, too much Humidity and at a high temperature, you'll get a weakened underlayment. Low humidity at high temperature, you could get a flash, quick set of the material, slow flow, slow flow and healing. Uh, is the air conditioning or heating running today? Is it running tomorrow? Change in environmental conditions based on heating and AC can affect the installation of the material. Direct sunlight through a window, direct sunlight through a doorway, Wind blowing through uh, over the surface all may affect the performance or installation of that SLU. So these are conditions that at best should be monitored or should be monitored or if possible modified. So again, pay attention to temperature and humidity uh, as, uh, as far as uh, timing of the installation. Next slide. Next click, keep clicking Will. Uh, water is the fuel for the chemistry of this uh, of this product. Too much is too much. Too little is is going to be a problem. Too much, it's a weakened powdery surface. Uh, too little, uh, you may have problems once the concrete is fully cured at a later date, or once the underlayment is cured. Mixing time too long, you're eating into working time. Too short, you don't promote the chemical reaction. So again, watch your water. It could be as little as humidity or as much as adding too much water while mixing or the substrate sucking moisture out. So again, be cognizant of water moisture in the environment during installation. Next slide. Next slide. All right, your typical substrates uh, include concrete and wood, but these other materials or other uh, other uh, other uh, flooring systems, if you will. So again, talk to your manufacturer. What, uh, what, uh, what prep work do they require? What primer do they require? What underlayment they require to perform over these various substrates in addition to concrete and wood. Next slide. Uh, as far as installation, it can be installed by pump or barrel mixing. Contractors are comfortable and equally productive with either system. A pump might be viable or a, be a better choice if you have a large open area unobstructed by walls or other partitions. Barrel mixing may be fine where you have a lot of different rooms or areas, uh, walls up, partitions up, etc. But again, uh, contractors can do a great job with either method. So again, this is what you're going to see, barrel or pump mixing. Next slide. Uh, when applying the product, whether by pump or barrel, it's important that you maintain a wedge. So each successive pour of or application of the underlayment readily bleeds into, flows into uh, uh, the existing product on the ground. You don't want to create a cold joint. Next slide. 
If you apply new material to product that's already hardening, uh, you can create a cold joint, but the bigger problem maybe is as you apply the new material, it flows up against and over the top of the existing material and you could create a ridge or a bump that may show through if you're doing a vinyl flooring or some soft flooring. But you should always maintain a wet edge from pore to pore. No cold joints, uh, no other bumps or other defects in the surface. Next slide. Uh, once the product is poured out or pumped, uh, a gauge rake is used to distribute the product. You'll notice on the gauge rake, uh, there's adjustable feet. Uh, this helps to, uh, this will adjust the level or thickness of the underlayment product. Uh, next slide. And once you hit the surface with a gauge rake, you'll take either a spike roller or smoother. Uh, the spike roller or smoother breaks the surface tension of the SLU. It allows it to flow better. It allows to heal better. So this is a very important step. And again, this is the last step of the insulation or tooling. Next slide. Next, next click, Will. Again. Uh, once you mix the product and apply it, you've got about 20 minutes of time. Uh, from uh, to handle the product. Uh, you can see in the foreground, the, the surface is starting to lose its wet sheen or glaze. That's pro that product is beyond handling. And as you move forward, it's going to uh, be less, uh, it'll be uh, less, of, uh, it'll be more of a problem to correct any defects. So if you take a gauge rake or such through the surface, you will have problems. So be aware of the working time uh, because any, uh, any handling of the product, tooling of the product after its ideal working time or healing time, uh, you will have surface de defects that will have to be created, uh, uh, remediated before the start of the tile installation. Will? Yes, Howard. It, it's yours. All right, I'll make this quick uh, based on where we are in timing. Uh, but excellent job, Howard. We're going to stay on. I'm sure some people might have some questions for you. Just to kind of tag on to Howard's presentation, I just wanted to do a quick mention of the uh, early stage leveling or ESL um, and, and really what it's all about and why. So, uh, you know, the concrete needs that moisture. So this, the sealer is applied or the curing compound to hold the water in. That obviously becomes a bond issue later when division nine or the flooring comes in. Uh, those bond breakers need to be removed. So we've got a, a product that's being used and the labor cost, that's a temporary situation that creates another labor cost to remove it. So uh, can we get rid of that step? Well, absolutely with ESL. Howard, could you mute yourself, please? So ESL also expedites uh, schedules as well. So if you're able to get in early, uh, you can get in before walls are built and obstructions and massive other trades uh, are in your way. So you're able to do larger areas more efficiently, uh, thusly lowering most labor costs for leveling applications. So just to make it real quick, um, concrete finishing costs can be curbed or reduced because now we don't need to power trial it. Now we don't need to try to hit a 35 or a 50 FF. We simply ask a concrete contractor uh, to broom finish it and leave it uh, 3 eighths of an inch or a quarter inch lower than the intended elevation finish level. So we're saving money on concrete. We're saving money on uh, concrete finishing costs. No moisture testing is going to be necessary for any type of flooring. So you're saving money there as well. You are using less flowable hydraulic cement underlayment or SLU. Why are you using less? Because we've used a moisture vapor control system instead of a curing compound. We've kept that water in that slab permanently until it naturally dissipates slowly over time. 
that moisture that has been kept in that slab that will be there much longer is not an issue for floor covering. We've put a leveling compound over it before we've seen the concrete go through major deformation or curling or changes or cracking due to loss of moisture and water. So therefore, we use less leveling than we would in a remedial or, you know, once construction has been completed in the build out and all the concrete has changed and, you know, curled and cracked. Also, we eliminate any extra change orders uh, from all the different subs in way of uh, finishes, the floor finishes. And we've helped expedite the production schedule more because we've given them a truly flat. Well, we seem to be losing you. Surface to work over. Will, you're going in and out. I am sorry, but uh, attendees, we have had nothing but technical difficulties today. I. Uh, so there are so many advantages to it. It really comes down to, hey, all right, fine. Tell me what the cost is on the early stage leveling because now I see that we're incorporating a moisture vapor control system. So we know that's gonna increase the cost. Well, the reality is, the cost of the All right, everyone, I wanna thank you for attending today. I'm sorry for all the difficulties. This has been a difficult day with uh, people's internets and uh, uh, their internet speed. And uh, I appreciate it. I hope you attend our next webinar coming up soon here. It'll be uh, towards the end of this month. I believe it'll be on the 28th. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, I did put a, uh, if you look in your chat screen, you'll see uh, Howard's email address for his uh, CEU, but you also can email him or myself and let us know what your questions are. We will actually have this up on our web, our uh, YouTube page, uh, probably in the next three days, it will be up and, and there for you to review and go through. Um, there really weren't any questions at this time. So I wanna thank all of you for attending. Sorry for the inconvenience. Thank you for staying with us. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.